Welcome to the preaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the truth of God's Word without compromise, raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed and refreshed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. quick I'll preach fast go to Psalm 23 <laughs> Psalm 23 verse 1 don't believe me I'm starting the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters he restores my soul he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death say I'm going through it I'm not camping out I will fear no evil. Why? Because he is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. He prepares. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Say he did that tonight. Praise the Lord. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What are we talking about, Pastor? Psalm 23, the day we live in. Prophetic Psalm of the day you and I are in right now. If you haven't been with us yet in this series, Psalm 22 is the day Jesus lived in. Psalm 24 is the day of His return. Psalm 23 is chock full of great stuff you and I can learn about how to live right now. Because this is literally prophetic of the church age. Which, by the way, when I say for our day, I'm not talking just end times. I'm talking about from the time that Jesus ascended to heaven, the church age began. So that church age is over. Psalm 23 is that very church age. Praise God. I've already given you four things out of this psalm. Number one, the Lord should be our shepherd. The Lord should be our shepherd. Verse one. What's that mean? Well, I thought he is. Now you get born again. He's your savior. You're born again, He's your Savior, but He wants to be your shepherd. Meaning what? You're His sheep. You follow Him. You learn how to walk after Him. You hear His voice. You walk after what He has for your life. So if you walk out what literally Scripture teaches about Jesus being the shepherd of your life, you're going to start walking in these other things that are listed down below here. Number two, as Jesus shepherds you, then He will do what? He will feed and refresh us in the house of God. Say it. He will feed and refresh us in the house of God. That's verse 2. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside the still waters. That literally is revealed to us as a place of feeding and refreshing. And it actually refers to us doing so in the house of God. Number three, Jesus the Word restores our soul. Say it. That was weak. Try it again. Verse 3, He restores my soul and therefore leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Your, uh, your soul's not born again. And Jesus is the Word. And the Word is what continually restores our soul. Praise God. Uh, number 4, uh, uh, the rod and staff, His rod and staff will comfort us. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because He's with me. For His rod and His staff, they do what? They comfort me. They comfort me. What is the rod? Word. What is the staff? Word. Holy Spirit. His Word is a rod to help me and you to be able to have what we need to live out this life. It also is that which brings us out of trouble. Remember the shepherd's hook is representative of the rod. That's literally what the word rod here means. The staff is not the shepherd's hook, the rod is. And, and that rod is what we use to fight off our enemies, just like shepherds use to fight off enemies that come against their sheep. But that rod also pulls us out of danger, pulls us out of the thicket, pulls us out of stuff we shouldn't be in. That's all from the Word of God. The staff is what you lean on. It's what supports you, what gives you strength. What's that? That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our strength. He's what supports us. He's who we lean on and gives us the power and ability to overcome in this life. All right, you ready for number five? Yeah. Verse 5, verse 5, you, God, prepare a table before me. Where? Before me. You don't have to get to heaven to get it. It's available here. It's available now. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Say it. God prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Number five, the Lord has provided all we have need of. The Lord has. Say he has. The Lord has provided all we need. The Lord has provided all we need. This table is a banqueting table. When Jesus died, when he was resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven, he laid out for us a banquet. He laid out for us a table. What's on that table, Pastor? You don't even have time for me to go through everything that's on that table. And my focus is not to tell you everything that's on that table. We could take months telling you what's on that table. What I'm going to teach you how to do is how to partake of what's on that table. Because if you don't learn how to partake of what's on that table, and this is what the enemy works at very hard, you, you're not going to experience what he has for you, what he's laid out for you. What are some of those things on that table? Well, I'll tell you what some of those things are. Baptism in the Holy Ghost. God's peace. God's joy. God's healing. God's blessings. Redemption. All that redemption uh, entails. Redemption from spiritual death, poverty and lack, sickness and disease. Redemption from our old identity, redeemed into a new identity, a new identity in Christ. All these things are on the table. Lots of things that we have promise of on that table that Jesus died and paid for. But here's the key. Yes, it's in the presence of our enemies. Twofold why that's revealed to us. Number one, it's not when you get to heaven. When you get there, there will be no enemies left. Where, that's why you see this psalmist prophetic of today. Where's our enemies at now? They're around us now. But what you and I got to learn to do is how to sit at that table and dine and partake of what God has for us. Could I get an amen? amen. Go to 2 uh, Peter 4. We'll prove this. Uh, 2 Peter 1, excuse me. 2 Peter 1 will prove to you, first of all, from the Scriptures New Testament, that He has provided, not going to, He has provided all that we have need of. By Jesus dying for us, it's already a done deal. If you're trying to get God to do something for you, you're, you're doing the wrong thing, man. He's already done what's needed. You need to sit down at the table and partake of what He has for you, praise God. You learn to be a good partaker of what God has for you, and you'll start get benefiting from that table. Satan's going to do everything he can to keep you from experiencing what God has at that table. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more tonight, more emphasis on tonight. I may not finish this part tonight. I'm going to keep this kind of short since we had a pretty long ministry time. But I want you to experience what God has for you. You've got to learn how to do that. Recognize first and foremost that what's on that table is bought and paid for. You can't earn it. If you try by any of your own effort or ability to earn what God put on that table, you'll never get it. It's not based on your efforts. I'm going to bring you back to a recent statement that the Lord gave me by the Holy Ghost. Very important. You don't come to Jesus and earn anything from Him. Amen. But you do come to Him and you learn from Him. Amen. To be a partaker of that table is not what you do in the natural. You don't earn it in the natural. You don't get it by natural strength. And before you got born again, guess what was the only thing you knew to live by? Natural means. Natural understanding, carnal strength, natural abilities. You had none of the God-given abilities working through your life yet because you weren't born again. You didn't have literally God's DNA in you at that time. You were a fallen being. If you had God's DNA in you, then you wouldn't be going to hell. Right. None of God's DNA is going to hell, but you were a sinner. Therefore, you had none of the supernatural ability on your life. Old Testament, folks, there was only a hand select few people whom God would impart the Holy Spirit to to do some things supernaturally during the time of the Old Testament. Right. Prophets were allowed for that. Priests were allowed with that anointing. Kings were allowed with that anointing. Kings were anointed like David to be a king. Prophets were anointed to hear God's voice and prophesy. Priests were anointed to minister on behalf of the people with the presence of God. But other than that, nobody else in the Old Testament experienced any of the presence of God. Amen. Now you and I have the ability to partake of what God has for us. But how do we partake of what God has for us? Number one, you're not going to do it by the old natural man or the old natural means before you got born again. Because this is now what you do spiritually to partake of these things. Walking by faith, not by sight. Believing what God says and truly honoring Him and His Word by acknowledging that with your heart, speaking it with your mouth, acting upon it with your life. And knowing that you have to learn also spiritual benefits of the Bible. 
Because the, the world teaches you if you, need, if you need money, if you've got a need, what does the world system teach you? Store up, store up, store up, work harder. You're working three jobs, work five. That's what, the, literally, that's what the world teaches. You got to do more, earn more, work harder, store up. But that is not what the Bible teaches. Right. See, it's totally opposite of what the world says. Yes. And what the Bible teaches is that, yes, you can seek wisdom from God, and you should. And yes, you've got God-given abilities to utilize to get wealth, and you should learn what they are and tap into them. But guess what? As you start taking what you do have, and you start giving, it is given unto you. How many stories? Woman that was about to make a little cake, give a little bit to her son and die. How many times do you see God sending a minister of God to them to say, no, 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 no. Give me the first part of that cake. Amen. What'd she do? She gave to the man of God. What'd God do? Brought supernatural supply. Yeah. How about the woman that, you know, all of her family, her husband died, all of her family was taken captive and, and they were going to take all of her family away. And all she had was just a little bit of oil in, in a jar. And what the Lord say, go get every vessel you can get and fill up all these vessels and sell it. And you'll have enough to pay off your husband's debt and keep your family and all your family together, not lose your home. I said, that's some pretty good stuff right there. Amen. Can you say amen? What she do? She listened to the man of God and she poured out. She poured out. She didn't harbor. That's right. She didn't keep. She had a little bit of oil. What did the prophet say to do? Pour it out. Pour it out to another vessel. Pour it out to another vessel. Pour, she wasn't going to keep that. She's going to sell that to somebody else in her case, but it's going to somebody else. Right. All through the scriptures we see this. So you got to learn. Why do we come to learn from him? Because you didn't know how to do this God's way. Right? And God forbid you got born again and you think because you're born again sit in church, you're smart enough to tell God how to do life. No, no man. See, we come and we don't earn. We come and learn how to receive what he has for us. Praise God. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. Say the table set. set. Turn your neighbor. Say time to partake of it. <laughs> Second Peter. Now, now, when we talk about partaking of what's on this table, recognize something else. Does God want us to reap the benefit of all these things on this table? Absolutely. But Christianity isn't just come and get for you. Why do I want to learn how to get healed? So you can help other people learn how to get healed. Why do I want to learn how to prosper? So you can help others learn how to prosper. Surely you're not thinking of just prospering yourself and then not helping somebody else learn God's ways of doing that. Surely you're not thinking of just get healed yourself and then not offer an opportunity to help somebody else learn how to get healed to God. Amen. What you freely receive. So God wants you to sit down and partake of this bounty, but not so it's just about come and get blessed, get blessed, get blessed. God wants you to get blessed so you can be a, and help other people do the exact same thing. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, stall as long as I could. Hope you're there. Yeah. Verse 1, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. We should all be bond servants. Yes, We're not all called to be apostles. We should all be a bond servant of Jesus Christ. What's a bond servant? Voluntary slave. That's right. He's not going to make you one. Right. Being a slave or subject to God is not a bad thing. Being submitted to Jesus is not a bad thing. Can you say amen? amen? He says, to those who have obtained. Ooh, man. I, I, I'm not going to have time to preach on this verse, but it goes right along with what I'm telling you here. To those who have obtained, like precious faith. You should underline that. Like precious faith. What's like precious faith? Same faith Jesus operated on. Same faith these disciples operated on. Same faith everybody's ever used. Anybody you've ever read about in the Bible that's operated by faith, guess what? When you got born again, you obtained the same precious faith. You didn't get a different kind. I said, you didn't get a different kind. You got the same kind. To all those who obtain like precious faith with us, how? By the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, by Him making you right with Him. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace and peace. Aren't you glad to know that can keep increasing in your life? Grace, heaven's help. Peace, man, more, more God's peace. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. How do we get it? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. How many want more grace? More of heaven's help. How many want to experience more of God's peace? Increase in your knowing God and knowing Jesus. Not know about Him. To know Him. 
The better you get to know God and Jesus, the more you're going to experience heaven's help, more of God's peace you're going to experience. Praise the Lord. Verse 3, as His divine power, as His what? Humans, humans did not do this. Human effort didn't do it. What do you mean His divine power? When He raised Jesus from the dead. His divine power has given to us all things. When did that happen? When Jesus was raised from the dead. Amen. What was His divine power? When the Holy Spirit went into hell and brought Jesus up from the dead. That's what this is referring to. At that time, what did He do? Has given. Not going to. Not will one day. Come on, church. Has given to us what? All things. How many? How many? All. Come on, tell me out loud. All. All things that what? That pertain to life. What do you mean life? Eternal life? No. Talking about life here on earth. What you need on this earth to experience the God kind of life. Well, man, I wish God would bless me with this or provide that or do this. The Bible just said he's already given it to you. Amen. You know why? It's on the table. Sit down. Learn to sit down and be a partaker of what's on the table. You're, you're trying to get God to spread the table. God's saying, what do you mean? I already did. Amen. God sure wish you'd do this for me. I already gave you everything you need for life and godliness. Godliness means to be God-like. To be like God. What you need to be God-like, He's already given you the ability to do. The, the day that anybody enters into a covenant agreement... As a man and wife in a marriage covenant, you have now get, been given the ability to release on your life. I'm chasing a rabbit here, but this will pertain. I'm just showing you an example of this. The minute you do, you now have released in you the ability to become a husband and the ability to become a wife. You're going to try to be a husband and wife with your own strength and ability, you'll fail. When you learn that God's anointed me to do it. Now listen, if you're single, that anointing hadn't been released yet. And that's what young couples don't understand. When you initially get married, you're not a husband and wife yet. You're a man and woman who entered into a covenant. Right. Now you're going to learn how to husband your wife, and you're going to learn how to wife your husband by the anointing of God through His Word, knowledge of His Word, of how I can now do that because He's empowered me to do that. God. See, this is what I'm going to be dealing with on our first men's meeting at our new location. We're going to have a whole series of messages on uh, one day, and I'm going to deal with the issue of the anointing of God on your life to be a husband. As well as the anointing of God on your life to be a man of God. What most people don't understand when they get married is they just think, I'm a husband, I'm a wife. No, you're not. You're a man, and you're a woman, and you're married. You're a newlywed couple. Now, if you want to become what God has given you, right? When you get born again, are you a disciple? No. So you know that. When you get born again, what are you? You're a convert. convert. Right? Now, what the Bible teaches? Yeah. Come on, you know the four growth stages here. If you grow up as a convert, you keep developing, converting from old ways to the new ways of God. You start looking to the Word, getting in church. You become what? Who knows? A, a living letter, an epistle. You start looking like the Bible. That's a good thing. I said, that's a good thing. You keep developing as a pistol, going to church, giving now, sowing your tithe, giving offerings, serving in the house of God. You're baptized in all three areas. Water baptism, Holy Spirit, baptism of the body of Christ. Yes. Mercy in the body of Christ. That's not born again. Right. If you're sitting in church idle doing nothing, you're not baptized in the body of Christ. Baptized in the body of Christ means I get immersed in the body. I get connected in the body. A lot of Christians haven't learned in Ephesians 4 that the Bible says what really gives you strength is when you use the part God gave you, when you take the God-given ability He gave you to add to the body. Amen. I'm not preaching against anybody. I'm trying to help you understand what makes you stronger. Can you say amen? amen? Every part is supposed to supply Every part is supposed to supply, do its part. Amen. Can you say amen? So you and I got to understand that when we have the God-given ability in us to be a husband and a wife, that doesn't mean it's automatic. Hey, man, I found out I had a call of God on my life to pastor. I found out I had a call of God on my life to preach. Does that mean that, that the minute I found that out, that ability was already fully released on me? Lord, no, I had to develop in that ability. I had to develop in that anointing on my life to pastor. I had to develop in the anointing on my life to preach. Amen. Amen. I'm not bragging by any means, but hopefully after 22 years, I've gotten a little better at preaching the Word of God. Praise the Lord. 
If you're laughing, I guess I haven't. I'm going to do an altar call for all of you. Can you say amen? Does anybody think I've become better as a preacher in 22 years? Man, I used, I used to be rapid fire. I used to, be, I used to preach so fast, you know. I listened back to the tapes. It was back during tape. I listened to those tapes. I thought, how'd they get anything out of that? It's only by the Holy Ghost they could have got something out of that, man. You kidding me? I talk so fast. But see, I'm trying to help you understand, man. God has given us an ability. Say he's given us an ability. He's given us an ability to be partakers of what's on that table. But you got to learn how. You got to quit crying out to God. God, do this for me. God said, I've already given you everything that pertains to life and to godliness. I've already given you. What else pertains to life? See, it's not just money. It's not just food. It's just not clothes and stuff. Man, how about the God-given ability to be a husband? Is that part of what pertains to life? You better believe it is. How about being a godly parent? Absolutely. That's part of what's on the table, man. Amen. That's part of what he's given you an ability to be a partaker of. Right. And when you obviously start partaking of those things and enter into them, I guarantee you what? You're going to experience some good stuff. Praise the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Tell somebody, God knows how to spread the table. Praise the Lord. His divine power one day will give us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Some of you are still snoozing. He didn't even catch it. His divine power one day will give to us all. Huh? It's in, and it's in the Greek language. It's not added. It's a done deal. Everybody say it's a done deal. Done deal. So he has already done what? Given us the things that pertain to this life and to live godly. Watch this. Watch this. Through the knowledge of him. How does it come? Through the knowledge of him. Yes. You get to know God. You begin to get to know what you have available. Amen. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not saying you get to learn totally how to partake yet. I'm saying you get to know what's available. He's provided all things. How do I know how to learn about what those all things are? Get to know him. You get to know him, you start learning what you have available to you. You get to know him, you start learning how to be godly. You get to know him, you start learning what it takes and what, how God will help you become godly. Because you're not going to do it on your own. No way. Right? right? So it's through getting to know him. Say knowing him. Not knowing about him. This knowledge of him is not just, oh, I, I know the Bible. Said, no, I'm talking about getting to know him personally, intimately. So this comes about through the knowledge of him. Watch who called us by glory and virtue Four, verse four, by which have been given In case you missed out in verse three of the past tense application. Verse four, hit it again. Twice in two verses by which have been given, not going to, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Here we go. This is what's spread on the table. Yes. Not going to be, have been given. He has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Watch, that through these promises, we may be partakers of what? The divine nature. Because yes. these are divine things. These are spiritual things. Healing, healing is not, hey, it, it affects the physical body, but healing doesn't come from the physical body. See, that's why some of you don't understand healing yet. Healing doesn't come out of your physical body. Healing comes out of your spirit. It's a divine thing. When you become a, a partaker of these things, you start tapping into the divine nature that's in you. And it'll affect the outward man. It'll affect the body. Healing doesn't come to the body. Healing uh, it doesn't come out of the body. Healing comes out of the spirit to the body. Right. You understand? Yes. So you got to recognize that when we start tapping into these things, we're tapping into that divine nature that's in us. Having, I like this, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through the lust, uh, through lust. So that would be me. Praise the Lord. Yes. Jesus name. Hey, I, I'd, I'd give a better amen to escaping the corruption of this world. I, I'll give you one more shot at it. Amen. Now watch this. Back up here to verse 3. All right. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to what? Life and godliness. As you get to know him, here's a very important point of how to partake of this table. You ready? As you get to know him, you, you will then get to know what you have available. You need to know what's available on the table. But you know why a lot of people don't know really? I'm talking about revelation. You know why they don't have revelation of what's on that table? Because they don't know God. 
Christianity is not a self-help program. Right. If you're not coming to know him, you're not going to learn what's on that table. Or you're, it's not going to be revelation. You're not going to be a partaker of what's on the table. If the whole purpose is I want what's on the table, but I don't want God, it ain't going to happen. Right. If it's about me, I want to serve me and get what God has for me. Just pray a prayer and run and get everything he has. But I'm going to keep living for me. I don't want to know him. You're not going to partake of what's on that table. Because you partake through knowledge of him. You get to know him. You get to learn what's on that table. Tell somebody you need to know what's on the table. Wait, wait, wait. Tell them. And it comes by knowing him. See, what do we talk about over and over again in this church? It's all about relationship. You, you got to develop this relationship with the Lord and with the Father through the Holy Spirit. I did not come to God to get a relationship to get stuff from God. Too many Christian Americans are still focused on Christianity as a way to get what I need. But the heart of Christianity is all about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what was lost in the garden. That's what was restored to Jesus at Calvary. And if the focus isn't relationship, I guarantee you what? You're going to be hard pressed to be a partaker of what Jesus died and paid for. Because getting to know him opens me up to getting to know what I have available to me. And now I can experience it because here's why. Guess what? As I get to know him, I see how much he wants me to have this. As I get to know him, I see a part. As he opens my eyes up to what's on that table and getting to know him, you love me that much? You did that for me? You provided all this for me? See, now it's not like, oh, wait, hey, I want all the stuff. It's not like Christmas, forget about mom and dad, run to the tree. It's like, it's like looking constantly back, you, you did that for me? I have that for, you, you provided that? Right. See, out of that relationship, and it's not like you just come to get and gobble down, you actually have a, an incredible gratitude for what he's done to lay out uh, on that table what you have available. Because you begin to see it through the sacrifice he paid for you to get it. The way he provided it was taking your place on the cross. Can you say amen? Now, I want to throw this out here before I wrap up tonight. I want you to get this, all right? Here's the, here's the biggest issue that Satan deals with. Remember, he prepared a table for us where? All right? Could have had the guys do it tonight, but you can picture it. So picture we got this huge table. We couldn't get one big enough to put everything on it God has. Anyway, you know, so we got this table set here for us, right? And, and believers are all around this table, okay? But now guess what's standing behind the believers all around behind us? Our enemies. Our enemy's not at the table. Right. Now listen carefully. Our enemy's not at the table. Your enemy's not even standing between you and the table. He don't have that right. right. You didn't hear me. He don't have that right. Amen. You have a table before you. Your enemy does not stand in front of you if you're facing the table before you. That's right. Your enemy's behind you. Your enemy's all around you trying to get your attention. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, yep, yep. Here's a problem. Here's what the enemy wants to do. And I'll, I'll get more into this uh, on, on uh, Wednesday, next Wednesday. Here's what your enemy wants to do. Your enemy wants to turn your focus away from the table to the trouble. If he can get you focused on the troubles of life, you're turned away from the table. You're not going to be a partaker of what God has for you. And this is what Satan works at. He works with all kinds of stuff in our life to get us turned to focus on trouble. And you're going to see what it comes down to. It comes down to anxiety and care and worry. Whatever you want to label it. Concern, care. Oh, I don't worry. Oh, don't tell me you don't have any concern about anything in your life. About stuff that bugs you. That disrupts your peace in your mind and what you think. I wonder if I'm going to ever get my bills paid. I wonder if I'm going to ever get healed. I wonder if God's ever going to bring me a mate. I wonder if God's ever going to fix this kid of mine. I wonder if God's ever going to do it. See, those are all the things of life that Satan tries to get you consumed with to turn to the troubles. And when you turn to the troubles, remember this, your enemy's not between you and the table. Right. He pulls your attention away from the table and he puts your attention on the trouble. Yeah. And now you're looking to your enemy. Right. All you got to do is turn your back to that dude and say, I ain't paying attention to you. I'm going to sit down. Because yes. guess, guess who else is at the table? Creator. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who yes. set that table for you through his death, burial, and resurrection, is waiting for you to sit down by faith and partake of what he has for you. With all the other saints that already got smart enough to know how to do this. Right. Can you say amen? Yes. But let us be reminded of the key. Who's the head of the table? Jesus. What's the focus? What's on the table? No. The king who sits at the, foot, at the uh, very uh, uh, foundation of that table. 
at the foot of that table who laid out for us the kingdom. Hallelujah. You don't focus on the kingdom, folks. You focus on the king. Amen. You'll see this next week. When Matthew 6 says, seek first the kingdom, Amen. let me tell you something. Years ago, I said, okay, Lord, I'm seeking the kingdom. I'm seeking the kingdom. He says, you're seeking the wrong thing. I said, you said to. He says, you'll never learn about my kingdom if you don't look, learn about me, the king. Amen. You seek the king, you'll learn about the kingdom. Yes, amen. You get to know the king, you'll get to know all about his kingdom and how it functions. Amen. What Jesus is saying is, quit focusing your attention on doing things the world's way. Turn to the king and learn about his kingdom and how his way is to do things. Yes, amen. See, we're back to learning of him. Yeah. Right. Can you say Amen. Yeah. And when you do this, Matthew 6 is clear. It says you won't worry. Let me tell you what Satan's working at here. How many understand a key factor of partaking of this table is what we know as faith? Yes. Yes. Right? You're never going to partake of what God has for you without faith. Right. True or not true? true? The average believer honestly thinks they're walking by faith, but yet if they really seriously did what Corinthians said and examined their life to see if they are actually in the faith, walking out what faith is... A lot of them would be amazed at how much they're still being affected by the words that's coming out of their mouth and the actions they take based on what's going on around them. Yes, amen. Faith speaks in line with that word. Faith acts in line with that word. No matter what you see going on around you, it does not move you. It does not move you. Faith is what causes us to become partakers of, at this table. And you have to learn of Jesus how to become a partaker through faith of what's on that table, what's rightfully yours. Amen? Amen. And I'll start laying some of those things out tonight, and then we'll come back and start studying them next week. But I want you to see this. This is very important, all right? Because this table's sitting here, and it takes faith to partake of that table, what do you think Satan wants to do? He wants to totally disrupt that faith of mine. He wants to totally get me out of faith. There's multiple things he'll try to do to get you out of faith, but here's one of them. You cannot, I don't care who you are, you cannot walk by faith and have any anxiety, worry, or care on your life. Impossible. They don't mix. And if you go back to some of the very foundation of Brother Kenneth Hagin's faith teachings, you'll hear him say the exact same thing. If I am saying I'm in faith about a situation, but in reality I'm worrying about it, you're not in faith. Amen. Go read Matthew 6. Do not worry, Jesus said saying. Amen? Amen? You want to be a partaker of what's divinely at that table? You can't worry, have care burden you down in life and walk by faith at the same time. Right. He who walks by faith walks in perfect peace. It guards his heart. It guards his mind. I didn't say you never have a thought about other situations in your life, but they do not cause you to worry. They do not cause you to fear. They do not cause you to get anxiety. The number one reason we have a, a country so stressed out today is because of decisions that Americans have made to put them in positions they should have never put themselves into, and now they have no way out. Amen. They have no answers. Now, I'm going to tell you, partaking of the things of God by faith doesn't just mean we live roughshod and we just do whatever we want. Somehow God provides for us. That don't work. Because when you learn of Jesus, you learn how to handle your finances biblically. You learn how to become a good steward over what God's given you. One of the number one things that causes care and worry and fear in almost every married couple's life today is money. And the biggest part of that is bad stewardship. Bad stewardship because we want to live beyond our means in America. Our neighbor's got a 52 inch TV. I got a 42. I, I got to go upgrade, man. Our neighbor's got a new truck. I got an old beat up one. I got to go get a new one. Our neighbor's got this. You know what I'm saying? We always want to try to get what everybody else has got. Amen. It starts today in most kids' lives from the moment they actually get out of the house and get married. Because mom and dad, who's been already 30 years advanced on them, and if they did it right, and it took them a while to get all the stuff they got, but see your kids come out of the house, they want everything you got now. Yeah. Amen. It took you 20, 30 years to get. Good can you say amen? amen? If you can't say amen, say oh me, and I'll pray for you in just a minute. <laughs> see, it's not just about I can do whatever I want, and I just believe Jesus go through life. You understand what I'm saying? If I as a pastor, if I as a pastor did not listen to God, pray, seek Him on decisions for this church, I'll guarantee you what, there's going to be some stress put on my life. 
If I'm just roughshod doing, hey, we're just going to try whatever, you know, and whatever works, works, whatever don't, don't. I'm going to tell you what, man, we're going to be one mixed up church, and many are today. Because yes. most pastors don't know how to pray. I say most, I'm talking about America. Look how many churches there are in America. No. And how many pastors are Holy Ghost led? So they don't know how to pray because if they did, they'd be listening to the Holy Ghost. They sure do know how to play golf. They definitely know how to do, you know, prepare their videos for their, les for their lessons, you know, for every Sunday. I, I like the story Dr. Barclay had of the one pastor who, you know, he went to preach for him, and they're, they're headed towards the sanctuary, you know, and uh, he passes his secretary and says, hi to her, and he said, aren't secretaries wonderful? He said, well, yeah. He said, they're so, it's so cool with technology and secretaries today, you don't even have to study anymore. Pastor Barclay, they're walking. Pastor Bar they're not to the sanctuary yet. They're like in a hallway. Pastor Barclay grabbed him, stopped him, and said, excuse me, repeat that phrase. He said, you know, you don't even have to study more. Technology is so cool, man. And, and my secretary is so good. I mean, having somebody hired like, you don't even have to study. He said, what are you talking about? Oh, I just give her a subject that I feel like, oh. not prayed about, that I feel like sharing with my church family. I call my secretary up. Here's the subject for this week's sermon. Now go on the Internet. Get me all the information on it you can off of the little study tools in there. I'm serious. It shocks me today how many people literally buy mass thousands of prepared sermons online. I don't need some other preacher to tell me what to preach to you. Wait, 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 wait. Let me back up. There's something wrong if some other preachers tell me what to preach to you. I'm supposed to get that from the head of the church whom I'm serving. Can you say amen? Oh, man, you just, I tell her the subject. She pulls up some verses for me. She gets it all ready. I start walking out to the pulpit. I don't even have to pray, man. She just hands me my notes. I get up in the pulpit, and I preach a message. Brother Barclay looked at me and said, the only reason I will do this service today is because you advertise, you told your church family I would share with them, and therefore I will. But I got a word for you. You will never see me back in this church again. We need to fire you and go hire your secretary and put her in the pulpit. She's doing all the study and not you. Can you say amen? So we're not talking about, guys, you understand. I mean, we're not talking about just doing whatever and somehow God just gets us, you know, to feed off of this table. Now, we're not earning it. We're learning how. We're learning how. Right? to be partakers of what God has for us on this table. Let me lay some quick things down for you, and we'll close for tonight real quick. This will help you. Write these verses down. We'll go back and look at them later. Uh, it'll be good for you to study uh, during this week, though. 1 Peter 5, write these down. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 9. Write that down. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 9. This is where you're to cast all your care. You really need to study that out, what that means. You really need to study on what this means. Cast all your care upon the Lord for he cares for you. You're supposed to be sober and vigilant because your uh, adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You need to learn what's going on there. Yes. Because this has to do with worry and therefore now looking at the trouble and not the table. Right. All right. Here's another one. James 4, 7. Write it down. James 4, 7. We're to submit to... God, this table's prepared for us where? Presence of our enemies. So our enemies is doing a work to try to keep us from partaking what's at that table. Now, don't be fearful because he can't do anything we don't let him do. Right. James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the yeah. devil, and he will. Yeah. So obviously, if we work that situation out, we're going to be sitting at the table good and pretty. Can you say amen? Here's another one. Revelation 12, 10 through 11. Revelation 12, 10 and 11. He's an accuser. You need to learn what he's accusing you of. You need to learn how he's trying to accuse you of different things and how he's working on you all the time with thoughts to accuse you of stuff. If it's, tr if it's stuff that's true, you need to fix it. Amen. But most of the time he's not. He's a liar. Most of the time he's trying to accuse you of stuff, and I'll get into that, of stuff that you obviously uh, need to understand or just lies and stuff to try to keep you once again looking at the trouble, not looking at the table. But I love verse 11. Verse 11 says, how do we overcome this accuser? There's three keys to this. All right. Three keys. Blood of the lamb. Two, word of your testimony. Three, loving not your life to the death. I'll get into that. Last one. 
Uh, Matthew chapter 6, 31 through 34. Matthew 6, 31 through 34. And this talks about not worrying about stuff you have need of. Da, da, da. It goes on to say, uh, uh, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all these things that are at the table. All these things will be added unto you. This is another point you got to learn. We got to become kingdom minded. We got to become kingdom minded. Can you say amen? Anybody want to learn how to partake of the table? Then get back here next Wednesday, and we'll tell you how. This concludes another message from the ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. If you would like to find out more about us or contact Pastor Baker to have him as a guest speaker, just visit us on the web at cffchurch.com. That's cffchurch.com. You will also find many great resources that will help you further your walk with God. You can also contact our ministry by phone at 817-491-0624. That's 817-491-0624.